Hello, welcome to The Daily Politics. It will be the full red carpet treatment for China's President Xi when he begins his four-day state visit to Britain. But can we challenge the Chinese on human rights at the same time as bringing out the begging bowl? Is a rebellion brewing for George Osborne on tax credits as Labour pledges to reverse the government's cuts? Islamic extremists aged under 18 face having their passports removed and anyone with a conviction for extremist activity will be banned from working with children. But will these new measures help the government win what the Prime Minister's called the struggle of our generation? And it's almost 50 years since Harold Wilson told MPs their phones wouldn't be bugged. But has the then Prime Minister's assurance ever been heeded by the security services? All of that in the next hour. With us for the whole of the programme today, Douglas Carswell, UKIP's sole MP and Labour's Dawn Butler. Welcome to both of you. Joining us for the next half an hour is Liam Fox, Conservative MP and former Defence Secretary. Welcome to you too. Thank you. Chinese President Xi Jinping begins his first state visit to the UK today and he'll receive the full red carpet treatment with a state banquet to be held at Buckingham Palace. But the visit has proved controversial, with human rights campaigners accusing the government of being so focused on trade and economic growth that it's overlooking human rights abuses committed by the Chinese regime. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn has vowed to raise the matter of human rights with the Chinese president. But yesterday the Chinese ambassador to this country told Andrew Ma he didn't expect Labour to do so on such a high-profile occasion as a state banquet. Uh, first of all, I think the state banquet is for Her Majesty, it is her show. You know, uh, uh, either uh, Jeremy Corbyn or others are their guests. I think the British people are very uh, gentlemen, very smart. They know, you know, how to behave on occasion like this. But we are not, we, we do not shy away from discussion about human rights. In fact, I have a good meeting with Jeremy Corbyn last week. The Chinese ambassador then. Dawn Butler, if Jeremy Corbyn doesn't get a private meeting or meetings with the Chinese president, will he raise the matter at the state banquet? Um, I spoke to Jeremy's uh, office today. He will be having a private meeting with President Xi and he will be discussing human rights and human rights violations. So that meeting will go ahead. He will have the meeting. It will be a private meeting. So I doubt very much that after the meeting he'll come out and say what happened. But be assured that he will have the meeting and he will raise the issues. Right. So you don't think he'll then go ahead and raise it at the state banquet as the Chinese ambassador is warning him not to do so? Um, I don't think it's a case of, you know, Jeremy being warned not to do something. I think that's more likely to have the opposite effect with somebody like Jeremy. But I think the point is that if he's going to have a private meeting and raise all the issues and to hopefully uh, have an in-depth discussion with him, then that should, I would imagine that may well suffice. Will it suffice or should it be raised? at the state dinner? Well, I, I think it would be wrong if he turned up at the dinner in a free Tibet t-shirt. I'm sure he's not going to do that. <laughs> no. But I, I think it's, he's well within his rights to, to raise the issue. Look, but you know, China is not brilliant when it comes to human rights, but I think we have to make sure we're not too high-minded about this. When you've got a trade deficit of 5% a year, you need the capital to come from somewhere. The price you pay for economic uncompetitiveness is that you end up having to uh, go to countries like China for the investment. Right. I mean, Liam Fox, shouldn't the Prime Minister be raising this issue publicly, um, if not privately? Um, he is the Prime Minister, after all. He is the one who is, to some extent, uh, you know, hosting uh, the Chinese president along with the Queen. He upset the Chinese when he met the Dalai Lama in 2012. So he doesn't seem to be scared of raising these issues. Well, the Prime Minister's obviously made um, a major point by meeting the Dalai Lama, so it did uh, register big time in China. But one of the reasons that you want to build relations with countries is so that you can have some leverage. If you simply say, we're not talking to X country, you don't have any ability to, to change and shape what they're doing. And so it makes sense for us to have a strong trade relationship with China. As Douglas says correctly, we have to have capital investment coming from somewhere. That, if that relationship is strong enough, it gives us the ability to be able to raise these yeah, issues. And I would expect them to be raised uh, <coughs> fairly robustly in private. Uh, right. But what about publicly? I mean, Barack Obama did so in the US state visit. Why doesn't he do it publicly? The, qu the question is where you think you're getting most uh, effect and it's whether you're actually trying to achieve change or why you're trying to achieve uh, uh, an effect for an audience. Well, Dawn Butler? I, was gonna say, I think it's more important that the 
uh, Prime Minister raises it publicly so the country knows where the Prime Minister stands than it is for the leader of the opposition in Jeremy Corbyn raising it privately. So is, I think it's more important. And I also think probably the discussions last week in regards to China building uh, nuclear power plants, you know, needs to be needs to be discussed because people may think he's not raising it because he wants to get the money from China, which would be wrong. Isn't the story about China really the amount of progress there's been. This is a country that was responsible for the Cultural Revolution and, and, and all the sort of murderousness of the past. It is now producing an economy that is integrated, mm. part of the global economy. It's wonderful to see our universities and the capital of London full of middle-class Chinese who come here to study and, and, and to visit. Uh, that's the face of China. Well, what about the dangers? Except, 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 except that um, yesterday the Chinese ambassador was talking about human rights and how human rights have improved in China, but his definition was entirely about economic progress. It has to go yeah. hand in hand with a wider concept of rights, of, of, of equality across race and that gender, and also it has to be about uh, the independence of the judiciary. Correct. Uh, all these things Absolutely. have to come. All so right. we have to, we can't isolate one element Absolutely. of it without considering well, the others. Well, let, let, let's move on from human rights uh, as an issue to raise uh, with the Chinese president to cyber espionage, to the worry and fear of many people of allowing the Chinese in to a very sensitive part of the, industry, the nuclear industry, for example, um, and reports today that GCHQ will be setting up some sort of surveillance of the Chinese to prevent them uh, launching a cyber attack on us. I mean, is that really the road we want to go down? Well, people talk about uh, these different elements as though they can be disaggregated, but actually cyber crime, cyber espionage, cyber warfare are part of a continuum. And one of the risks is in, in dealing with uh, a power like China is that they will actually put malware into your uh, system that you may not detect as in. Now, last year, JP Morgan in the United States went for two months without even discovering that there was malware in their, in their, in their server, and they had a huge so, uh, number of their, of their clients compromised. Now, very mm. often you wouldn't know that that was there until it had been activated. Right, right, but then are you saying, I mean, in your book, Rising Tides, you quote one unnamed figure in Hong Kong who suggests the West is so seduced by what it sees in terms of economic growth in China that it can't see what lies beneath. Is that, the, is that the current Conservative government? I think, I think that we have to take the two things into account. Yes, there are benefits of trade, but that should not blind us to the risks that we potentially would but, face. But should the government be pursuing this sort of engagement in trade with the nuclear industry? It should be in engaging up to a point, but there are... There, for well, how example, do you do that? Well, for example, when it comes in terms of, of the control of the software that actually would control the usage, you have to have guarantees on that. I would be happier if the central elements of that came from the United Kingdom. I can't see the Americans being very happy about an arrangement where the software that would actually do that actually came from China. So you're not happy with the current arrangement as I it is? I think we have to question it. Right. I mean, is it just about, is it just about the money, do you no. think? With George Osborne, is, I mean, well, he has been on. at the forefront of embracing all this, on, is it? On the nuclear deal, I think it's a terrible deal in commercial mm. terms for this country. We're paying a huge subsidy, in effect, guaranteeing uh, China and a French company a certain share of tax revenue going on for sort of 30, 40 years. It's, it's, it's a bad commercial deal, but that's that's a separate consideration. Right. I mean, what rights. interests me about what Liam just said, it seems like you're at odds with your Chancellor, which actually I think is a good thing, because obviously uh, MI5 has said they're very concerned about China and Russia being involved in any sort of such deals, especially within the nuclear industry. So it sounds like you're at odds with your Chancellor, which I think you're putting the safety of the country first, which is a good thing. Well, I think we have to be... You, there's a difference between building the uh, infrastructure and having control of the software in terms of its operation. So it's a lot more complex than I think we've but seen. But we could build the infrastructure. You, we used to be the leaders the problem in the is building not, the of prob the, the problem so is in not the, the infrastructure. UK, we could build the infrastructure yeah, ourselves. We see, could that's be not the problem. innovative. The, the problem in terms of security would lie in the software that controlled its operation. That's, that's where the risk would come. What about the American response to this new relationship, this golden era uh, that David Cameron is talking about? Um, I mean, the Financial Times reports a former senior American American official is saying this is a case study in how to kowtow. Is that how they view it? Well, it's President Obama himself said that he was less concerned with what was happening in Europe and he wanted a pivot to Asia. So it seems to me what's good for one's good for the other. All right, we'll leave it there. Because it's time for our daily quiz. And the question for today, sticking with the theme of China, is what British delicacy does Chinese President Xi want to sample on his visit to Britain this week? Is it A, fish and chips, B, deep fried Mars bar, C, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, or D, spam. Haven't heard of that for a while. At the end of the show, someone will give us the correct answer. I'm hoping.
I guess. <laughs> that wasn't one of the options, I'm afraid. <laughs> the government is continuing to face pressure over its controversial cuts to tax credits. Labour are holding an opposition day debate on the issue in Parliament tomorrow. And the shadow chancellor has vowed to reverse the cuts. Following the general election, George Osborne set out savings of four and a half billion pounds to the tax credit bill. From April, the threshold at which tax credits begin to be withdrawn will fall from £6,420 to £3,850, and people's income over this amount will be reduced more steeply. In 2017, any family which has a third or subsequent child born after April 2017 will not qualify for more child tax credit. The Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, tweeted that Labour would reverse the tax credit changes. Tomorrow, Labour will use an opposition debate to urge the government to think again, although any vote that takes place will not change the law as the reforms have already been approved by Parliament. The chairman of the Work and Pension Select Committee, the Labour MP Frank Field, is also seeking a backbench debate and vote on his alternative plan to try to soften the impact of the changes. Mr Field says that the current income threshold for the withdrawal of tax credits should remain. This would be paid for by withdrawing tax credits more sharply on gross earnings over £13,100. George Osborne is also facing pressure from within his own party. Here's what former Cabinet Minister Andrew Mitchell had to say on the Sunday politics yesterday. These are very significant changes and therefore I'm sure that the Chancellor is uh, keeping an open mind and will be looking to see whether any specific uh, tweaks need to be made in the comprehensive spending review which takes place next month. Andrew Mitchell there. Well, joining me now is Frank Field, Chairman of the Work and Pensions Select Committee. Frank Field, you're looking at ways of ameliorating the tax credit changes. How exactly? Well, you've explained them really rather well. Oh, good. Uh, in that it proposes to raise the tax, uh, the, the, uh, the tax credit threshold to the new, what will be the national living wage so that everybody is protected below that. But you also explain there's a price to that. It means people oh. above that will actually lose even more than they would lose under the Chancellor's proposals. Well, isn't that the, the, the major flaw in your plan? Um, all you've done is sort of displace uh, what some people feel is the problem with these tax credit changes. You've just raised it to people who are earning slightly more. Well, it would be if that's where it stops. Um, but as you heard Andrew Mitchell say about there are going to be some changes in the autumn statement. Well, he hopes. So, well, he, he, he wouldn't have been speaking like that without actually speak, uh, talking with the Chancellor. So there will be more money, and I think it's important that them, that more money is not spent in the idiot way that Gordon Brown did when he punished lower-paid workers by abolishing the 10p, mm. by actually spreading it around over everybody, but it's actually then concentrated on the plan that's put forward, taking the very poorest out, so they, they're not affected at all, but those above any uh, mitigation that the Chancellor comes up with actually is concentrated on them right. and not spread around amongst everyone. Are many Tory MPs talking to you? We know there's unhappiness. We've heard from uh, a number of Conservative MPs and, and Boris Johnson is also unhappy with the plans as they stand. Have you had discussions with them? Well, more than discussions. I mean, they're having discussions with the Prime Minister um, and with the Chancellor that they're being talked to uh, individually. They're not, the, 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 the government doesn't want to face the group as a group of, uh, collectively. Oh. Um, pressure is therefore being applied in the most intense form to those. We have a group of, of MPs whose name will be on the order paper when we seek a debate uh, tomorrow. There'll be others that you've mentioned some, um, others which are involved in those quiet discussions whose names will obviously go on the order paper before the, before the debate, which I'm confident that we will get. But before the debate, next week, the Lords um, will be looking at whether they approve of this measure. And as this measure was not in the manifesto, I hope that led by the cross peers, the cross bench peers, those of no uh, particular party, yeah. will actually defeat the government. So the government won't have got the authority by early next week to go ahead with these changes and then uh, and then the debate will what what will be what will the government put in its place 
Yesterday, John McDonnell pledged to reverse the cuts. Do you back that strategy? I do. What he's actually said is, is what he said this morning, which is more important, that he'd actually make other budget or cancel other parts of this budget to actually make sure the, this very group of, of uh, uh, vulnerable workers who the Tories courted um, before, during and after the general elections as the strivers. I very much support them on that, that in fact that they should be protected, but other budget changes helping those who are much better placed than those people at the bottom of the pile should be cancelled. So he's actually done precisely what critics have said he should do, is not just make changes, but say how All they're right. going to be paid for. He's done both of those things. Frank Field, thank you. Uh, Liam Fox, the government hasn't been straight with the electorate because they didn't say this was how they were going to make their cuts to the welfare budget and many of those people who voted Conservative wouldn't have done so if they'd known about these tax credit changes. Well two things. First of all let's look at the big picture. We're still overspending as a country by about 80 billion pounds a year. When we do that builds up debt interest and ordinary taxpayers have to pay for that. The average taxpayer in Britain is paying about £1,900 a year for debt interest. Until we get that down, that will be a burden that we'll pass on to our children and grandchildren. That is wrong. The government said they would eliminate that. Should it be so, done on the backs of low-paid work, low well, workers? Being done, it's being done, it's being done a, quite widely across the board. We're focusing only on one thing here today, but let's just stick on that one. Mm. The tax credits are going back to about the level of 2007-08, so it's not back to the Dark Ages. And since then, we've had big increases in the tax threshold, so a lot of people, fewer people are paying tax. We're seeing inflation which is negative and wage rise is now well above 3%, so living standards are rising. And we're seeing the introduction of a living wage. Now, yes, the tax credit changes will bring income down, but it has to be seen in context of these other changes as well. Right, so you don't think they should demur at all from the, the plans? Well, if, they, if, they can, if, if the sort of thing that Frank's talking about is viable and doesn't hurt other people more and still raises the same amount of money... Oh, but the you, key would, thing you is, would back a Frank well, Field alternative? I, I, not, so necess not necessarily I until I saw it, and I would yeah. be very wary about the details, uh, uh, and I'd have to see them in front of me. But the right. thing is, are we going to save this money or not? We have still a huge budget deficit to get down in this country if we're not going to pass huge debts onto future generations and we have to do it and it will not be painless. The problem is that, that many of your colleagues feel you're attacking the very people you say you want to help, the strivers, people in work. Even Andrew Mitchell uh, saying yesterday that the tax credit changes uh, should be tweaked. Do you agree there should be some more money put around even in the interim period until all the other changes come into place? Uh, part, to try part, part of that will depend on what the Chancellor does in terms of tax thresholds, what's happening in other parts of the system, which of course we don't know yet. Well, they always say there is a whole package that's going to come into play to try and mitigate some of the cuts and in that's tax what credits. We have to look yes, at. but we know that the Institute of Fiscal Studies has said that there will still be something in the tune of three million households who will be adversely affected for a period of time to the tune of over a thousand pounds, which is a lot of money for people on low pay. Is that justifiable? It depends what's happening in the broader economy. Are we giving these people a, a better chance of prosperity in the future? Are we creating an economy that will actually grow? What we cannot continue to do, and it's really important we make this point, we cannot continue with an economy that's based on high taxes, well, high welfare, low, wa low wages, which is where we've been up till now. Should they go further then? Should those tax uh, credit changes be even well, more if we severe? Can, if, we're able, if we're able to mitigate some of those changes by making the tax burden lighter on some of those who are lower paid, so much the better. And Frank Field's point about Gordon Brown's abolition of the 10p rate uh, is, is absolutely correct. Reversing the cuts, um, we couldn't get a straight answer um, from some members of the, the shadow cabinet who weren't sure whether they were going to actually be reversed. But now John McDonnell has said they will be. How would you actually meet up the shortfall? Where would you find the money from? Right, I think there are uh, a couple of things that we need to address that Liam's kind of tried to gloss over. I mean, David Cameron lied. You lied. There's almost 14,000 households in Brent that would be affected by this change. And on, Sorry, what on, did David Cameron lie about? Lied about... Um, taken away people's tax credits. He said he would not touch tax credits and yet still you're doing just that. So you lied to the electorate and I think that's important because in the House 
Uh, on the floor of the House, I'm not allowed to say that because, you know, we have to be, have parliamentary language. But on your show, I can say it as it is. <laughs> and you have. And I have done. And the thing is, so almost 14,000 households will be affected by this. Now, you talk, and I absolutely agree with you, that we need a high-wage economy. Now, what you're talking about as in the living wage is not the living wage as by the Living Wage Foundation. It should be £9.15 an hour, not £7.15. Although it's a lot more that Labour so, was promising so, at the time of the election, Dawn Butler. Yeah, Ed Miliband was behind. Absolutely. Ed Miliband was not ambitious enough in the minimum wage. It should have been, he should, Ed Miliband should have started off as £10 an hour. So he wasn't ambitious enough, I agree. All right. Well, let, let, let me just come back to Liam Fox on that. I mean, what, what, what do you say when some of the evidence coming out today, admittedly from Labour, who have put a list of around 70 marginal Conservative seats in which the numbers hit by the changes to tax credits outweigh the Conservative majority in these seats. Well, no wonder they're worried. Our job is to make sure that the country moves forward okay. economically, that we get more people in work. But if you lose those seats, you well, lose your majority. I, okay. I, I, no, no, but that, okay. I, think, I think that's, if I may say, that, that is just the wrong way to go about looking at our politics. We've got to do what we think is right for the country in the longer term. The and when we get to the next election, voters can judge whether we've done so. Right, you support tax credits, <coughs> don't you, Douglas Gowes? Well, you voted I, in favour of them. I voted with the government on this, yes. but I'm also supporting Frank Field's amendments. And let me explain why. Right. It's, it's so you've had a change of heart a no, bit on this. No, no, not at all. It's absolutely vital that we stop the taxpayer from subsidising low pay. There are a lot of big corporate interests who at the moment have their payrolls subsidised by the taxpayer. That's wrong. That has to change. So employers should pay more, which so, is what the government so has said it's trying to do. So that, that, is, that needs to be done. But at the same time, and we've been here before, in 2010, when George Osborne tried to change the child benefits, Unfortunately, there was a, a cliff edge effect, if you like. Mm. And what Frank has very sensibly done is said, can we do something to make the process of introduction a little bit gentler? He's a creating a new cliff edge, though, really. No, it's actually, if you look at the details, it's actually going to be much gentler. And I think this is, people who want welfare reform like I do, I think should look seriously at what Frank's suggesting, because it gives welfare reform a good name, and I think it makes it harder for critics of welfare reform, who frankly aren't being fiscally uh, in the, well, we'll, and we'll come the, to Dawn uh, again because uh, I'm, the, I'm, I'm being realistic about this. I think if you look at what Frank is suggesting, it makes it easier to justify welfare reform, and it doesn't discredit the idea of, of, of reform to the tax credit system. Right. Let me come back to my original question because you wanted to raise those issues with Liam Fox. If John McDonnell is promising to reverse the cuts. How will he pay for them? He's costed how he will pay for any of the cuts that he's put forward. Where? So he has costed those. I, have, I haven't got it's the figures. I, no, uh, we I need to see, we need to it, see that, though, don't, don't we? Where is yeah, it? No, absolutely. And I'm sure that Frank, I'm sure that he will come on board. John uh, McDonald will say, John, this, you, this you is you how we... About, well, hang on. Well, let me just finish. Douglas, Douglas, let me just finish. You can come back on it just I agree that... You should, what you should do is take out low wage, low, wage, low pay, yeah. take them out of the, of the tax bracket so that they can... So if you're earning 13000 which is the minimum wage, you shouldn't pay tax on that because yeah. you end up paying tax on that and then the government ends up paying it back to you in tax credits. So do you support so Frank Field's plan? I agree plan? that they should be taken out of that bracket, but this is not the way to do it because what you're actually doing is you're making people poor. Right, but you still haven't answered my question. You say John McDonnell has costed it. I'd like to see the costings of where he is going to find £4.5 billion. Pounds. That's the saving from these tax credit changes. Yeah, and Joe, I haven't got the figures Fine. in front of me. Do you think it was I'm wise sure, to promise that I'm before sure, actually specifying where that money was going to come from? I'm sure that he has got those figures and I'm sure he's working through those figures because there's one thing for sure, there's a different way to do this and we know that there is a different way to do this. The Tories have the way to do it and well, that's on the backs of MPs the poor need... and, and, it's not, sure. and it's not saying that they're not economically competent and I just think it's wrong to do that. And it's, it's MPs, wrong to... MPs need to be straight with the British public. You can cannot continue to have a country where big corporate payrolls are subsidised by the taxpayer. It keeps people in poverty. It's fundamentally so you pay bad more, economics Douglas. and you unethical. Pay them more. That's why we should raise the living wage, but reduce the uh, uh, extent to which the taxpayer subsidises low pay. Right. Well, Donna, where would you? Where would you? If you? They get All right. Paid well, more. well, if you if you do what you suggest, where would you cut the welfare budget in order to balance it? There'll be other ways that I'm sure that it could be. Number well, one, that they could be. It could be more efficiently managed. So some things are not. I mean, I used to work in the employment. To the tune so of four and a half used, billion pounds. Well, there, there'll be other ways rather than because this will not save the country money in the long run because you'll have more people who would be homeless. You have more people that would be having to use food banks. You'll be more people. So this will not save the country money it, in the long run. It's it's saving pennies and it'll. This end is up getting. Is it, will it more. will it not save the money that it is supposed to do so and. 
in the end, are there other ways, are there other monetary levers that you could use to try and help those on low pay? Well, if you want to have people with more disposable income, the best thing for the state to do is to take less money out of their pockets in the first place, which means lower taxes, which of course we've already done by raising the thresholds and taking uh, and it huge, numbers, of money, doesn't huge it? numbers of money. And that, that costs money, but it's good because it gets people uh, rewarded for actually working. Douglas is right, we have to stop this incentive of taxpayers subsidising big corporations. I think we all agree with that. Um, and we need, to, it, we need to change the way our society works. And, but we have to be realistic that we cannot continue to live beyond our means. We're, we're, we're just having this discussion as though we're in a fiscally neutral position. Mm. We're massively overspending as a country still. The government is trying to get it down. And the Labour Party are resorting to Mickey Mouse economics when they're telling us... That yeah, was my absolutely. <laughs> well, well, you were, and, it wasn't, and, you were, and you weren't the originator <laughs> of that either, Douglas. That's not all clay. But, we, can't, but we, cannot, we you cannot have a situation where you can move to a higher wage economy, a lower tax economy, unless you're willing to control your overall spending. And if if this is a relatively small in terms of public spending contribution, it's it not takes small us, for the people it, who are well, going to struggle and it, suffer it as a result. Us, it involves. takes us back to the 2008 levels, which was hardly uh, a time of penury under, under Labour. And since then, we've seen wages rise, we've seen inflation down, we've seen tax uh, thresholds rise, and that has all helped people move in the economy in, in the correct direction. Now, or, this cannot, this, no one's suggesting this is, this is can be a painless process, this total correction to our economy. But I go back to the point, we need to understand finally. that we can't we continue to... Why don't we start at the top instead of Because there are... Let, let me give you one tiny example. Hang on, I'll hang give on. you a tiny example of where it's been. Last if you're, and then Dawn, I'll give you the final if, one, then we must on, finish. If, for example, uh, one thing that uh, Labour quite often talk about is oh, you must uh, bear down on, on uh, the buy-to-let people. Under George Osmond's last budget, those on buy-to-let see their tax very considerably increased yes. to the extent that they will say we've been taxed out of existence. Well, for the first time, I mean, people, you know, we're, we're having a different discussion. I'm going to give you the final mm. word and then we've got to... I was going on. to say we could tackle tax avoidance, we could tackle uh, duty, tackled. we can tackle duty fraud that hasn't been tackled. That would bring in £1 billion into the economy. There's lots of different well, ways that you can... That Dawn you Butler, can, the low-hanging fruit can, has probably can, gone by now. But anyway, support Frank's go. amendment. That would solve a lot of it. Right, yeah. <laughs> so are you going to support it? Uh, yes, I Will think you I will. Will you support it? Uh, if I'm going to have a good read at it first. All oh, right. Oh, well, then we might have got, because this is well done, Douglas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, what have fencing, the Eton Wall game and politics got in common? Well, they're all minority sports, of course. But could politics be starting to pull in the big crowds? Well, if a recent increase in party membership is any indication, it might. The Labour Party's membership has almost doubled from just under 190,000 in December 2013 to, according to the latest figures, over 370,000, in an increase that has been put down to Corbyn mania. But the SNP has seen an even more spectacular increase in membership, from 25,000 in December 2013 to 114,000. That's nearly a fourfold increase. And despite losing all but eight of their MPs, the Liberal Democrats put on more than 10,000 members after the election, increasing their membership to 61,000, according to the latest figures. The most recent statistics from the Conservatives are that they have just under 150,000 members. That's half the number they had in the mid-noughties. If they've had a surge in membership in response to their recent electoral success, they're not telling us. UKIP says it has 42,000 members. The Green Party in England, Wales and Scotland, 70,000, and Plaid Cymru, almost 8,000 members. Total party membership in the UK sits at about 816,000, but that figure is dwarfed by the estimated 3.5 million people who were members of Labour and Conservative parties in the early 1950s. Douglas Carswell, is there any evidence that parties that grow their membership better reflect society at large? I think there is. And I think uh, from my own party's point of view, it's been actually, frankly, quite disappointing. We need to look at some of the changes that both the Labour Party and the SNP have introduced with a, a system of what you might call i-membership, online membership. It's very easy to scoff at what happened with Labour. They allowed all these people to sign up and they elected someone I think is unelectable. 
But that may be the true. But they now have more members than all the other parties put together. And I think we need to look carefully at what it is about their model that we could learn from and improve upon. And that's exactly what my party's doing. Right. Is it? Right. You, but at the moment, you don't think they're doing enough in that direction we're, to we're, try and attract that broader spectrum? We, we should have done this a lot sooner and a lot faster. It's the future of politics. And I think we need to make that change and make it quickly. You need a system of I membership that allows ordinary people to sign up very easily and be involved. I wouldn't go as far as to say they should be uh, choosing the leader. I think that leads to all sorts of problems. Right. But I think they should certainly what, be involved in the candidate selection process and open primaries locally. What do you say to that, uh, the comment by Douglas Carswell, that it can lead to um, electing someone like Jeremy Corbyn, who in Douglas Carswell's mind uh, isn't going to win a general election? Well... First of all, I, it isn't a problem for, um, for the Labour Party. I think Jeremy's been good and the election has been good. And we need to look at the fact that the people that have come into the party. So, for instance, last week I had my GC meeting, our general committee meeting, and we had 50 people in the room. We discussed policy. We discussed going out and getting Sadiq Khan elected as mayor. It's been a really good thing for our party. What, and for, for morale, the party. you mean, in terms of just swelling the membership numbers has just helped the party feel better after, after its disastrous defeat? No, it's been good. For, it's been good. Yes, it, it was a disastrous defeat. And what we have to do is identify who we are as a party and these new members, and they're a wide, ch they're a broad church that have come into the party, and they've come in and they've helped the debate in saying, where do we go as a Labour Party? So we, you know, things like tax cuts to the ta the cuts to yes. tax credits. What are we going to do about that? The things like Trident. What are going to be our policy? Issues. What 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 are we going to do as a party? What's our program? So you think these people have elected the right leader? Yeah, I think I, you nominated course. him, didn't you? I nominated him. Absolutely. You didn't vote for him, though, did you? I voted for him, but not first. I voted for Andy Burnham first. Why? But because I was support. We're not going to do a K no? Burley, are we, Jay? No. Oh, <laughs> oh, what is a K Burley? I no, but why? But why? I mean, you, if you're saying that that these are, you know, this has led to a great discussion and debate within the Labour Party, you nominated him. Why? Did, why didn't you vote for him? Because. It, because Jeremy needed to be in the the spectrum of people that we had so that we had the debate from all sectors of the party. And so and that's what we've had. And the result, the net result is, yes, we've got more members than all the other parties put together, but we're also having discussions and debates. We need we are a membership led party. That's also where we get our finances right. from. The Tories have, you know, hedge fund uh, people that they can give them millions of pounds. We are a people led uh, party. Well, do you want to respond to well, that? trade union led party to get their money from the trade unions and I'm not proud. from the Liam I'm proud to be a trade union I'm no. really sick and tired but that's not what of conservatives knocking trade unions because of the trade unions who protect the rights of working people the very people that you are set to destroy that's not uh, knocking the trade unions I'm simply saying that it's not true that the labor party get their finance from their members they get their finance from the trade well, unions they the are trade members unions of trade unions, unions. Oh, call, they, and the trade unions call the tune of the labor party get, let's leave do that you aside. get your money from hedge fund millionaires and only really from the very rich we, and we get our we get our money from 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 donors, of course we do. That's what the facts say. And we get that from members too. I, I think there's an important point in this debate. As a constituency uh, MP, as a candidate in an election, what matters to us is it the number of members we have or the number of activists we have. And I think that we should be having this debate a little bit wider. I'm not so concerned about the number of members. Is that because you're losing them? Well, no, and I'm not so because concerned about the number of members. About I'm, concerned about the, I'm concerned about the number of activists, the number of people who take part in politics, and whether sometimes membership of a party acts as a barrier right. to people who would actually like so to become involved in the process. You don't really think it matters. I mean, we always struggle to think, get the numbers out of know, the I, Tory I, party. Per personally, do, do I really think it matters? It doesn't matter hugely. It's something of a barometer uh, of a party's uh, 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 popularity. Uh, uh, and is that the case. It's only really, I mean, it might have, have swelled voices of protest. Um, it, it, it might actually make parties feel better. Does it really, does it help you win an election? Well, I, I think it's really significant that only 9,000 people in London took place in the, uh, took part in the primary to decide who the mayoral candidate was. That suggests to me that actually the membership in London for the Conservative Party has ossified. But look, if the future of politics is to be organised using the internet, then all parties are going to face this dilemma. On the one hand, as a party, you need to aggregate votes, you need to bring people together. But the effect of the internet can be to actually uh, make your, your followership look like your, your Twitter timeline, very niche and selective. There's a tension there. And all parties are going to have to come up with the right model to manage that. I would say Labour is a class A example of how not to do it. All right. Just finally, um, Liam Fox, should cabinet ministers be allowed to speak freely during the EU referendum? Campaign? Yes. Why? 
if you ask the question, I'll give you the answer. Yeah. Because I, think... I was so stunned. <laughs> <laughs> Not by you particularly giving the answer, but by anybody giving the answer. Yes, so they should be. Because I think that ultimately the legitimacy of the result will depend on whether the voters think they have heard all the arguments openly and fairly. And I think any attempt by any side to restrict people's voice in that debate will li limit how people feel uh, the legitimacy uh, of the referendum has gone. And I think that's really important. And you... I think that in any case, um, people will find a way to make their voices heard. And I think the idea that you can actually gag people during a process like the referendum, given the multiple ways that we've just been discussing about getting information out, is unrealistic. Are I think... you worried they might happen, that they, they might be restricted, that David Cameron may prevent it? Well, th David Cameron, uh, as any Prime Minister, uh, can do, can enforce cabinet collective responsibility, but only in those willing to is, accept it as individuals. I, I think the issue is whether, right. whether David Cameron joins the Leave campaign, isn't it? I'm sure <laughs> that's the real issue. <laughs> Getting that last word in. Thank you very much, Liam Fox. Pleasure. So, the last week of British summertime. So how are MPs going to use those remaining daylight hours? Today, President Xi of China flies into Britain on a four-day state visit. Tomorrow, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn will meet President Xi when he's expected to bring up the issue of human rights. And the Chinese president will also address both houses of parliament on Tuesday in the Royal Gallery. Also on Tuesday, MPs will debate those controversial tax credit changes. On Wednesday, Jeremy Corbyn will face David Cameron at Prime Minister's Questions in his third outing as leader of the opposition. And on Thursday, controversial plans for English votes for English laws will be voted on by MPs. Well, I'm joined now by Kate McCann of The Telegraph and Joel Taylor of The Metro, who are both on College Green. Welcome to both of you. Thank Kate, you. first of all, how difficult is this tax credit row now for the Chancellor? I think it's, in, it's getting increasingly difficult. I mean, we've seen reports today that there could be um, some big problems coming down the line for George Osborne in the House of Lords, and particularly some reports that there could be uh, what's called a sort of fatal motion tabled, which could actually kill off this idea completely. It might mean that the House of Lords would vote against the government and that could block his plans altogether. So it'll be interesting to see what happens if one of those is put down. There are also some reports that that could force George Osborne's hand and he might have to make some changes to the government's own motion. I mean, do you think, Joel, that it can be compared to the poll tax or Gordon Brown's Tempe rate? I think the poll tax is putting it a bit strong, uh, more similar to Gordon Brown's Tempe uh, tax rate uh, um, uh, abolition. I mean, it's, it could very well be a, a, a big self-inflicted wound, and it's clear there's a lot of disquiet now on Tory benches, and there is pressure. I get the impression that they're sort of feeling around, trying to find a way that they could uh, alleviate some of the problems while saving face, but. Um, they have, they're running out of time. Yes, I mean, Kate, it's interesting because the Treasury certainly um, officially is saying that they are sticking to their guns, that the policy will go ahead. Um, but the more people we interview, certainly on the Tory benches, it, it, it seems they're indicating that there is a softening somewhere uh, uh, of that stance. Well, I think it's interesting the contrast between, as you say, Number 10 and George Osborne's message and perhaps what's going on on the back benches. So certainly there's been no softening from George Osborne as far as I can see. They're very determined and Number 10 again very determined that this plan will go ahead. But the, more, the closer we get to this debate, it'll be interesting to see whether the government will suggest a perhaps a softening at a later date. I mean, it'd be interesting to see how they would put that in place. I think they understand that while the living wage uh, changes will make, will kind of lessen the impact of this policy eventually, those are not going to come in quickly enough to do that straight away. So they have got maybe a short term problem that they need to deal with. The problem with tax credits, of course, is it's a really complicated area and it would be very difficult, or I certainly can't think of a way that they would manage to, um, to kind of get around this problem in the short term by perhaps, you know, limiting how this policy affects, who this policy affects. But we'll right. have to see. Right. I mean, Joel, do you think they've been taken aback, surprised by the level of resistance um, within their own ranks, as well as people who themselves are on tax credits and worried that they're going to lose out? Yes, I think so. I mean, certainly at uh, uh, the Conservative Party conference, Osborne's speech was uh, hugely warmly greeted. He's in a great position of strength, mm. seen as the favoured uh, successor uh, to Cameron at the moment. Um, and I don't think this, this, the, the level of backlash was anticipated. Um, it's being brought home directly to um, uh, Conservative ministers who are f fearful of how it might affect uh, votes in uh, ne next May. All right, Joel and Kate, thank you very much.
Today, the government launched its new counter-extremism strategy designed to confront all forms of extremism. David Cameron has said defeating extremist ideology is the struggle of our generation, as groups like the self-styled Islamic State add to their ranks of recruits. Convicted extremists will now be treated like paedophiles and be barred from working with children. Prisoners will be forced to undergo de-radicalisation and extremists will have their access to the internet restricted. Theresa May explained the thinking behind the new strategy this morning. And I think we do face an unprecedented threat from extremism. Groups like ISIL can um, beam their message of hatred into family homes through the internet. Uh, and so as we see young men and women and indeed whole families going to Syria and potentially to take part in fighting, then I think it shows us that we do need to step up our action to counter extremism. Theresa May. Well, we're joined now for the rest of the programme by the Conservative MP Nadim Zahawi. Welcome. And Dawn and Douglas, of course, are still here. We haven't let them go just yet. Um, Dawn, there have been uh, cases of problems with radicalisation in your constituency of Brent. Do you think it's helpful uh, with measures to treat extremists like paedophiles? Um, I don't think it's helpful making that link, but I do think that uh, David Cameron, as the Prime Minister, needs to address the issue. I think he probably got the tone wrong in the summer, um, blaming sort of the Muslim community as though everybody's responsible when this is just a, a faction and a, if you like a right-wing faction who are not Muslims because Muslims uh, do not believe what do you mean a right -wing in, in, faction? In, in terrorism. Muslims do not believe in terrorism. The Muslims that I know and my friends and, and the Islamic faith is a peaceful uh, religion. It's not a violent religion. So I think it's important that Cameron gets the tone right and because and when also he you talk, have to when engage. He, sorry, just to pick up on your point, because when he, David Cameron, in his conference speech, is that what you're referring to, um, was talking about the community, was he not implying that the community needs to do more if they see signs of radicalisation rather than that they are to blame? I think David and, and Theresa May, I think they said that, uh, that they were uh, accepting uh, extremism and so, as I say, you have to get the tone right and you also have to bring the community on board because mm. it is those are the very people that you do want, if they identify something, yeah. to feel safe enough to be able to come and well, say, look, uh, I think there's it, an issue. I mean, isn't that the problem? I mean, the government is not going to bring the Muslim community on board with the sort of language that we have heard this morning. And the Muslim Council of Britain couldn't have been quicker in coming out to denounce all these measures. Well, you need them. Well, it's just worth remembering, just to get balance in this discussion, is it was David Cameron, this Prime Minister, who's decided actually that m hate crimes against Muslims should be recorded as Muslim hate crimes in the way anti-Semitic hate crimes are recorded. I think that is important. It's stuff that, that the grassroots of the Muslim community actually want. This isn't, you know, there's no silver bullet here, Joe. There is no sort of dagger that you're going to stab the, these death cults with and it's going to be over. The whole community, everybody has to work together, local government, schools, parents. What we're saying today is there's a series of measures, including parents who they're 16 and 17 year olds that they worry about uh, that may be radicalized, where they can actually apply to, if to they can take their passports, passports away. Right? Yes. So this is a series of measures. I think actually David Cameron is doing the right thing. He's bringing people on board. And actually well, not the Muslim Council of no, Britain. Well, he hasn't brought them they, on board. They have to read this very carefully. Moderate Muslim, uh, you know, the moderate Muslim community is very much behind this and will engage with it. Look, we have to do something about it. We, I, I'd like to live in a country where we are intolerant of intolerance. And I want to be famous for, for living in a country that is intolerant All of right, intolerance. But let's take some the of the examples. The way you do that is by engaging the whole community. And I think it's right that the Muslim community, hopefully the majority moderate, peaceful-loving Muslim community, oh. as, as, as you right. refer well, to them, what should in, engage with What, in your mind, is going to constitute violent extremism? Mm. What, what will define that mm. that isn't covered by current mm. laws mm. Uh, uh, of mm. uh, incitement mm. Uh, mm. or hate crimes? You mean non-violent extremism? Because yes. violent extremism, there's, there's, and, there's no But what will constitute... And how will the police go after those individuals and right. gather evidence and make it stand up in this a court is, of law? I, and I, this is really difficult. But, you know, we could look the other way and say, look, you know, can't do anything about it, it's too difficult. We've got to a, a, engage with this agenda. You know, non-violent extremism is, is Anjum Chowdhury, and I'm glad now, you know, that actually the, the, the sort of the legal process has taken over and he will face, you know, his day in court. It's those sort of people who preach hatred, who preach, you know, violence, 
and do it in, in a way where they use our system, they use our sort of you know, fair play, our rules, and actually you know, subvert them. That's what we're going on. And, and many people would agree with that. The problem is, how do you go about defining it banning orders, s shutting up shops that sell extremist literature. Where is the line between legitimate debate, that mm. may not be very savoury, mm. but between legitimate debate and, and something that would incite uh, a group of people or young people to commit Ultimately, a crime? Ultimately, I don't think you can solve all of these problems with, with repressive measures. Liberal rationalism needs to become far more muscular in asserting its, it, itself. Isn't it extraordinary that people can go through the education system without uh, uh, getting, by a process of osmosis, if you like, a healthy dose of Richard Dawkins? We've got to make sure that our schools can achieve that. Mm. R r liberal rationalism has to assert itself far more uh, uh, robustly. And if you do that, then I think, you know, uh, people who, who question um, the, the, the truths found in the pages of, 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 of Dawkins, I, I think ultimately they, they, they're free to believe what they want, mm. but I think those views then become very marginal. Mm. Uh, liberal rationalism needs to be far more assertive. Right. Do you agree with that? Does it have to be liberal uh, in that sense? Because many people say that hasn't worked, that actually there has been too much freedom, that we haven't been tough enough on clamping down on hate preachers in the past. Yes, it's catching up, but we haven't done enough to stop people like that spreading uh, violent rhetoric. Yeah, of course we have to clamp down on um, hate preachers. I agree, but I do think that you, we need to uh, we need to have wider discussions and debate. So, so for instance, when on TV, if you're a young, if you're a young. Muslim, a young uh, black person, if you're on TV and you hear uh, your prime minister talking about you in derogatory terms or in hated terms, then that fuels something else. If you look at all of our policies, if you look at our international policies, mm. all of those things, we have to think about, you know, give how, me one how, quote. How, how, give me how one is quote it, that David Cameron has talked about how is, a, a, a black person or a Muslim in a derogatory One quote. Well, I could talk about. No, I you, could, no you're I talking could, about, could, you're talking could, about extremists I could talk like about, Abu Hamza, like Abu Qatar. Like Andrew Chowdhury. Question. Give me one quick. But this, this is not fair because you, you make these statements. It's just unfair. I was going to say I could talk about how he talked about stop and search, for instance, which was actually, very, I, I which was think, very, actually, which I, was very, I, uh, which was very you, alienating. I think, I think it's really important that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, regardless of party, is addressing these issues, and I think he's right to address them. And I think many of your viewers will think it's tone, bizarre that it, the loyal opposition doesn't recognise that we have a problem. We no, have no, a problem. No, no, no. I did not say well, that. I said right at the very beginning that it's good that the Prime Minister are addressing these issues, yes. and he has to but get. Has there he been has too much? tiptoeing around and now because of what's happened over the last few years because of is and a lot of people going to yeah. fight but blaming, for IS but blaming, that blaming people will not help us no counteract this issue Liberal so it's how it's how it's all started. addressed now we had a prevent strategy and that prevent strategy that under work? labor how did that work how did, How did it work? The, pre the prevent that were actually preaching this sort of hatred. That that is what happened. Not, not 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 in Brent. The prevent strategy. Maybe. The prevent strategy worked very well. And what it was was that peer to peer kind of communication and interaction, so that people said, right, okay, this is this is what it's about. This is what's going on in the real world. And that is what's all did needed. You can't. Prevent. You can't. Well, yes, prevent. Did, the thing is with prevent, it did prevent. Uh, the thing is with prevent, you can't you can't have empirical evidence to say, right, this is what it stopped happening. Because sometimes these things happen naturally. And so you can't say this is exactly what happened, but it was part of the solution. And so all I'm saying is that it's a good thing that David Cameron's doing this, but the tone and the message has to be right. So it doesn't have the reverse effect to what he's trying to I'm achieve. I'm glad you right. say it's a good thing that he's doing. Of course. And on that, we'll move on. Now, this afternoon, MPs will spend three hours debating whether they should be listened to by the security services, that is. It was almost 50 years ago that the then Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, assured MPs that their electronic communications would not be intercepted. But it's been suggested recently that the Wilson Doctrine, as it's become known, has never had the force of law, something Conservative MP David Davis raised at Prime Minister's questions last month. In uh, 2011, the Prime Minister quite rightly confirmed to the House that the Wilson Doctrine, the prohibition on the electronic monitoring of members of parliament uh, was still in force. Unfortunately, in July 24th of this year, the government's own lawyer, Mr James EDQC, stated in the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, in, a, in answer to a complaint from the Honourable Lady, the member for um, uh, Brighton Pavilion, that the Wilson Doctrine is not legally binding, cannot work properly, and accordingly places no obligations on the intelligence agencies. This is clearly inconsistent with the Prime Minister's previous statement. 
Can he clarify the status of the doctrine to the House today and confirm it has real meaning? I have got nothing to add to comments I have made about this uh, issue before, but I am very happy to write to the Honourable Gentleman and, and set out the position. Ah, well, a not terribly revealing answer there from the Prime Minister. Well, last week, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal ruled that the doctrine has no legal effect and that incidental collection of MPs' data would not constitute a breach of existing laws regarding the interception of parliamentary communications. Well, joining us now to discuss this is Sir David Omond, former Director General of GCHQ and one-time Permanent Secretary at the Home Office. Welcome to The Daily Politics. So was the judgment of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal right or wrong? Entirely right. Right. So There's there... a lot of misunderstanding about this. You, you have to understand what Harold Wilson was facing in 1966 when he made this famous statement. Mm. On the one hand, as he put it, there was delusion amongst members of Parliament that all their phones were being intercepted. On the other hand, his Home Secretary, Frank Soskis, was keen to intercept the communications of a number of hard left, small number of hard left members of Parliament. Uh, people like uh, Bob Edwards, MP, uh, Bernard Flood, Will Owen. Subsequently, we, we have discovered, of course, through history, that those individuals were Soviet agents, in a couple of cases actually run by the Czech intelligence services. So Harold Wilson, on the one hand, wanted to reassure mm. most MPs there was no question their phones would be intercepted. On the other, he had to convey in this rather subtle way that national security interests might mean that MPs, uh, a small number of MPs' uh, telephones might need to be intercepted. Since then, of course, 1985, new legislation, MPs were not exempted. 2000, further legislation, MPs were not exempted. Most recently, the court pointing out that, as you say, that the, 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 the Wilson uh, statement had no legal force. Mm. It was a political statement. Yes. Saying that actually what he was conveying, and Theresa May has put this even more clearly, is the threshold to get a warrant on a member of parliament is extraordinarily high and that has to be reported to the senior judge. Right. Well, uh, are you reassured by that? I mean, was it really, did you ever really believe it was legally binding in that sense? Well, I mean, let's sort of take what we've just heard and modernise it a little bit. And I think it was actually, the government should welcome the tribunal judgment. I think they do in the sense that it sort of finally, you know, put pay to the, to the idea that the agencies were deliberately targeting MPs. But if you modernise what we've just heard is, you know, 95% of financial crime, the agencies use this sort of data. Why should MPs, right, right. be excluded in some way if they behave badly? Yes, I that's, mean, that's should the they really here. be above yeah. the law? I'm, I'm, I mean, David I'm, Davis's I'm, 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 I'm is that very, they should be. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of MP exceptionalism. Those we elect to make the law should live under it the same as everyone else. Ooh. Now, I grant you there are things in the legislation that we need to change, but we should change them, not exempt MPs from them. Right. right. But what about private conversations, for example, between MPs and their constituents, um, information that, that may be confidential in that sense. Should that also be liable to be hoovered up in a general surveillance? Yeah, I mean, I think most MPs feel that we're being surveyed and watched and bugged all the time anyway. <laughs> really? So, uh, Do you? So, uh, so most of the MPs Do you think you're saying so, things so that are that interesting? So most of the MPs... <laughs> <laughs> you're, not, you're not most conspiracy of, theorists, are you? Most of the MPs that I talk to is like, really? I thought it was happening already. But the, the <laughs> wow. only thing... The <laughs> only thing... <laughs> The, the, only, the, only thing, uh, the, the only thing that concerns me mm. is that sometimes constituents will come to MPs uh, in full confidence thinking, well, I can tell my MP whatever I want and it's not going to come back on me because my MP has parliamentary privilege, my MP can stand up and, and say whatever on the floor of the House. And that's my only concern is if it affects constituents who might have, something they, want, that they might have something that they want to, to well, say to MPs. The yes. practice which is now in the public domain mm. and which I hope will be presented to Parliament along with the new legislation uh, in the next session uh, makes it pretty clear that you are protected mm. in that respect and mm. that one of the biggest protections there is the senior judge who has to be informed and who could have the with warrant withdrawn if he thought there was any question of misuse of this. I mean it's only going to be granted in the most exceptional cases when there's a very clear national security interest. Right. So, so this idea, uh, Dawes says that uh, she and her colleagues think they're being bugged all the time. I is that 
absolutely off the mark. Completely off the mark. And that's what Harold Wilson faced in 1966. And I swear, his doctrine was an attempt, without excluding it altogether, to say, actually, don't worry there are safeguards in place. Right. I mean, there is a lot of surveillance around. We do, we do know that. I mean, to some extent, Dawn is right. Um, surveillance is going on all the time. So some of your uh, metadata is going to be swept mm. up in that, isn't it? It is. One of the things I think we need to do is, is listen to some of the things Sir David said in his excellent report and perhaps contemplate a new British Bill of Rights. When the original Bill of Rights was drawn up, the relationship between the state and the individual needed defining. In the age of mass data, we need perhaps to redefine it with some basic law. But... The Wilson Doctrine is worthless, isn't it? I mean, I mean, as a political, so it's pretty well worthless now today, isn't it? Well, we've just heard, you know, at the time it, it was sort of to protect parliamentarians, you know, it didn't look into MEPs or any other of the devolved assemblies, you know, none of that. And actually, you know, in reality, what we've heard from the tribunal is there, there, there's sort of checks and balances in place and a way of working that protects parliamentarians as well as protecting the general public. We're all equal in this. The spirit of the doctrine is going to be there, I'm quite sure, in the proposals government brings forward next month for new legislation. And it will also cover special cases like journalists, which I think is very important, mm. ministers of religion, uh, the uh, legal professional privilege. So there are a number of exceptions where the threshold really does have to be very high. Can, can I just ask a quick question? Is there something in the doctrine, doctrine that says that the Prime Minister has to come to the floor of the House and uh, report on any changes to the Wilson Doctrine? Harold Wilson said, when national security circumstances allowed, so he put that caveat in, he would personally come forward. But of course, since then, we've actually had two acts of parliament. We've had endless statements by home secretaries over the years. So a lot of this has it. And now, of course, we have the codes of practice actually public. So you can actually read it. So I think the spirit of what Harold Wilson said is, has been met. Right, so is there really any need for this debate this afternoon, the three hours debate? None, whatever. Do you, you totally really just not worth it? It's a non-ish. MPs should be subject to the same laws as everyone else. What we do need to debate is the extent to which the state can pry on the individual, but that's got nothing to do with your status as a member of parliament. Right, I mean, David, I want, just before we finish, I mean, what do you make of reports today that GCHQ have been enlisted to make sure there are no trap doors installed by the Chinese when they build nuclear plants in this country? I hope it's true, because that, the president is Huawei, the Chinese company oh. that is selling uh, sophisticated electronic equipment for British uh, telecoms operators. And GCHQ has, as publicly announced, a team of experts working with the uh, uh, Huawei engineers oh. with access to the code to make sure that nothing is done that shouldn't be done. And I would expect similar arrangements to apply to the control software for a nuclear power station. But of course, it would be economic suicide for the Chinese to try and slip something through if caught. That would be the end of their reputation. Right. But but although it's a low risk, I think it's right to manage it by allowing the experts to... But we're right to be suspicious then in that way? Oh yes, certainly. I mean, a number of nations have the capability to do this sort of thing, and the Chinese are rather good at it. Right. I mean, should we embrace it, be embracing them then quite so closely? I think it's a very important relationship. I think having, again, those sort of checks and balances, you know, they're, they're, if they're coming here to invest in our country, to you know, whether it's infrastructure or otherwise, of course we should embrace it, but we should always remember that the, these are countries with their own national interests, and we have to make sure that People, British national interests I'm going to have to, because we've, we've got to get to the quiz, Douglas Carswell. Do you remember <laughs> the question, and can you give me the answer to our quiz? Well, the question was, which uh, British delicacy does Chinese President Xi want to sample on his visit to Britain this week? A, fish and chips, B, deep-fried Mars bars, C, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, or D, spam? Anyone? What's the correct answer? Fish and, chips. fish and chips. It is fish and chips. We made it quite easy. For you. It, it is well done. It should be. Hang <laughs> but you're the second tonight. person that said it. Pardon? From Clack. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you very much to everybody, to all of our guests, particularly you guys who have been guests of the day. The 1 o'clock news is starting over on BBC One now, and I'll be back tomorrow.